This is the Consciousness Podcast, and I'm your host, Stuart Preston. Each episode, I have a conversation with an expert in consciousness. Today, we explore consciousness in animals and how their consciousness provides insight into our own. My guest is Dr. Scott Husband of the University of Tampa. Dr. Husband's primary field of study is behavioral neuroscience with an emphasis on comparative neuroanatomy and cognition. He has studied higher level visual processing, the role of dopamine in attention, and dopamine hormone interactions in various species of birds. His research goals are to contribute to the understanding of how neural circuits and neurochemistry contribute to complex perception and cognition, and to investigate brain evolution by studying the brain and the behavior of non-mammalian species. We had a great conversation, touching on brain architecture, asking the philosophical question, is there something in life to be human? And the effect of language on the evolution of consciousness. So please enjoy this conversation with Dr. Scott Husband. I appreciate your time here with us, Scott. So let's just jump right in with this. And maybe you can tell us how the, the neural architecture of human brains is both similar and different from other animals that you've studied. Yeah, th- thanks, Stuart. So that's one of my favorite topics, obviously. Um, and so one of the things that sets apart the mammalian brain from other kinds of brains, especially when you talk about vertebrates, um, is the neocortex, or sometimes called the isocortex. You know, it's that six-layered mm-hmm. structure of some very particular kinds of neurons. And uh, only mammals have it, so it was kind of an innovation in the evolution of the mammalian brain. Um, that being said, right, I, I study birds primarily. And when you look okay. at um, comparative neuroanatomy, you see that although, you know, reptiles and birds, for instance, don't have that layering, they do have clusters of neurons with some very similar connections to, you know, lower parts of the brain and, and things like that. So mainly my work has been in, you know, a- along the lines of the argument that even though birds and reptiles and p- potentially fish don't have that layering, there's nothing special about that layering or those particular neuron types that necessarily enables consciousness, or, you know, I would probably more talk about higher cognition kinds of things. Um, Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's a de de facto need for a cortex in order to have higher cognition or consciousness. So what, what effect do those, those similarities and differences have? And, you know, I guess when you look at, uh, so a bird's brain is similar to a reptile's brain? Yeah, they're very similar. It, It obviously gets down to, you know, which species of which we're talking about, but, Right. Yeah, their basic architecture is roughly the same. When you get into some of the birds like crows and ravens, um, they they have some more kind of layering-like clusters of neurons, and you know we associate that with their higher cognitive abilities. Uh, but yeah, mm-hmm. it's like a basic same brain plan. And so, what have you noticed the the effect on consciousness? Because I know you just made a distinction uh, with cognition. Is there right. are you separating cognition from consciousness and what, what differences do you notice as you look at different brain structures in these animals? Well, I think, I mean, part of it is, you know, I think a very useful distinction um, and it was in a, a commentary I recently wrote was uh, Ned Block's distinction between um, access versus phenomenal consciousness. Mm-hmm. And just real briefly, access consciousness is just, the ability to kind of, it's kind of like a meta cognitive kind of process where you can kind of think about the contents of your mind and manipulate it and do things with it, planning, things like that. Phenomenal consciousness is what most people tend to think about. And that is just the experience of being a conscious being, I guess you could say. Um, what is it, what is it like to smell a rose or to experience pain or to yeah, the qualia? Yeah. Qualia. Exactly. So when it comes to phenomenal consciousness, you know, that's the hard problem, quote unquote, you know, how can we tell even other humans have this consciousness, you know, in that way, when it comes to animals, that's even more difficult to establish, you know, because they don't have language and those kinds they of can't things. report. Pardon? They, they can't report. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So yeah. that, that kind of introspective quality of, of phenomenal consciousness we just don't have access to it. So mm-hmm. most of the stuff that I study is more in the cognitive realm, you know, kind of attention, memory, cognitive flexibility. Those kinds of things are a little more approachable from an experimental you know, standpoint. And we can design those experiments to kind of get at those more specific kind of functions. Okay. So, and so 
I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so when it comes to the brain architecture and its kind of relationship, um, I think we're getting much, much closer in identifying certain circuits and certain kind of architecture in the brain um, that subserve these very specific functions like episodic mm -hmm. memory or um, prospective, like planning and things like that. Those are kind of more experimentally, you can kind of get at those better than you can this kind of broad consciousness thing, which nobody can even agree what that thing is. You know what I mean? Right. Um, and I, I think one of the things that we see in animals, uh, well, I can speak to birds primarily, is a lot of their processing is done at lower levels. So just as a, a random example, if you look at the visual system, uh, a lot of the visual processing that, that mammals and especially primates do is at much, much higher levels of the brain. Whereas if you look in birds, a lot of what their retina is doing and an area called the tectum is doing, it's very computationally complex. So they're doing a lot of that stuff at a lower level. Uh, and they don't necessarily need those quote unquote higher brain structures to be pretty visually, you know, capable animals. Right. It, but it seems like is some of the, the higher consciousness involved in the higher levels of the brain. So right. does that, does that mean that these the senses that they're processing and, and controlling within their own brains, it, it's kind of, they're almost limited. Their consciousness is almost limited by that fact right there. I think potentially, I mean, especially if we talk about phenomenal consciousness, you know, it, it, the richness of the signal, you know, what, what kinds of information are you drawing out of the environment that form those qualia? I mean, I think that that could change, you know, the, the nature of that type of consciousness for them. Um, it's, it's a really tricky thing to try to get at, you know, again, this phenomenal consciousness question. What is it like to be a bird or a fish or what have you, you know? Um, there's a really yeah. paper that you're probably familiar with. What's it like to be a bat? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and the, 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 the basic idea was, well, if you can agree that all the sensory stuff that's coming into a bat's brain gives it a certain picture of the world, a certain feeling, then you would have to argue that there is a kind of consciousness there, that there's a, you know, just like he said in the, in the title, you know, this was, um, I forget the author's name at the moment, but Nagel? yes, it was Nagel. He, he talked about, um, if you accept that all those sensory differences exist and are being processed, then that there is something like it's like to be a bat. And that is a kind of phenomenal consciousness. Yeah. And I find it interesting and I never really thought about it before the, the reflexive part, you know, in, in thinking about, because, you know, in my morning runs, I see bugs and animals and I quite often find myself asking myself, you know, can I imagine what it's like to be that cricket or that owl? Right. And I never thought, I never thought to myself, would that owl have the ability to know what it's like to be me or to imagine what it's like to be me? Or, I mean, obviously they don't have that cognitive thought right. there, you know what I mean? But within their capabilities, you know, is there the, is it almost a test of consciousness to even ask yourself if they can turn the question around? Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's it's probably a ridiculous question. No, I think it's an interesting one, though. I, it, it is, you know, part of your question reminded me that, you know, especially when we talk about phenomenal consciousness, the, the qualia that are being created by the sensory system, right, um, it's also joined with their body, right? So there's this idea of embodied cognition, that part of, right. for instance, consciousness is not just being a brain, it's about being a body connected to a brain, and all those systems that carry out the brain function and bring sensory stuff into the brain. So being able to imagine what it's like to be another animal, it may be impossible because there are so many variables that are unique to them that we don't really have. Like for instance, a bat has, you know, echolocation, which is a sense that we really don't have uh, or other animals can sense magnetic fields, you know, things like that. We don't have anything even remotely like that in our sensorium, you know, our, our qualia. So, it's an interesting question. I don't think animals, it, you know, a lot of times we can train animals to do very specific things. Um, you know, for instance, language and gorillas and, and things like that, but whether, you know, they have kind of a general cognition that we kind of exploit to make them do interesting things, but do they do it in their natural environment? Probably hmm. not. Uh, could we train yeah. them to do perspective taking, you know, with, with another kind of organism? That'd be Really hard experiment to do, but I'd be super interested in seeing if that could be done. Yeah, yeah, that would be that would be fascinating. Um, 
you mentioned the, the different layers of the brain and, and mm-hmm. I guess complexity of the brain. What, what role do you think consciousness has had in the brain's evolution? And I know that in reading some of your materials and supporting materials, there's, they seem to talk about brains as going from like, you know, fish and, and then birds and mammals, humans. Do you think that consciousness has played a role in that evolution or did that evolution come first? You know, what are your, what are your opinions on that? Yeah, that's, that's a really big question. So, um, because ma- mainly what I do is study brain, brain anatomy and brain evolution. Right. Um, you know, the whole chicken and egg thing is like, did, did, did the neural complexity of the brain become so great that consciousness arose or did something mm-hmm. like consciousness then feedback on the brain through our activities, through tool creation, through language uh, that actually shaped the course of the evolving brain. It's probably a little bit of both, which is kind of a cop out. <laughs> um, but yeah, you're I mean, I'm not a cop out, but I get it. Yeah, well, you know, it's like chicken and egg, which came first. Well, how do you define the chicken? You know, do you mean a proto chicken that wasn't quite what we consider a chicken, or you know, these categories right. trip us up, but. Um, I think for, you know, I think the biggest innovation in, in primate evolution was in the humans and it was development of language. Um, I think that enabled a lot of things that some animals can approach, you know, the sophistication of language and something we call proto language, where they can string together some symbols and things like that in, in unique ways, but it still doesn't quite have that quality of language. And I think the invention of language actually and tool use to, to a pretty big extent too, really shaped the evolution of the brain. You know, if we look back at our hominid, you know, ancestors from those earlier primates, uh, most, most brain evolution in hominids was pretty flat if you look at the size of the brain. And then mm-hmm. it kind of took off about a million years ago, give or take. <laughs> um, and the, question, the big question in brain evolution, at least as far as the human brain, is what was happening during that period? What were the climate, you know, the climate conditions that drove that tool use and innovation and the development of agriculture and all these things that, that came after? Um, I have to think that consciousness, it may not, have, may not have been the consciousness that we have in our modern era, but a kind of consciousness had to enable those kinds of technological developments and the development of language. And then it kind of just fed back in on itself and further drove very specific connections and patterns of connections in the brain that were then passed on, you know, in an evolutionary sense. Yeah. Like an evolutionary feedback loop. Yeah, exactly. Like it it ratches up, you know, you lock in those technological developments with language and then you can go even further into more abstract and symbolic thought and, you know, things like that. Yeah. Interesting. So given that, that the evolution and the different brains that you've looked at, it's, uh, you know, the question is, what, what can you say about brain structures and their circuits and whether there is a certain requirement for consciousness? And I think it's, as you've defined co- uh, cognition to consciousness, and, you know, in humans, it's a lot easier to look at. But in your studies, you know, of the birds, what, what conditions do you think there are for that or requirements for that consciousness from the brain? Yeah, so I, th- I think one one kind of useful way to think about about the nervous system is top down and bottom up processes. So, bottom up, mm-hmm. just kind of conceptualize. It's more stimulus driven, right? It, it's the qualia that are created in the animal's you know sensory world or what have you. Um, and then the top down is th- processes like attention, you know, bringing prior memory to bear on your current situation, planning. Mm-hmm decision-making, all those kinds of top-down processes. And so I think one of the things when people talk about consciousness, because of its complexity as a topic and as a, you know, as a thing, (laughs) uh, people talk about, you know, a lot of consciousness is probably top-down use of that bottom-up information. Like you have to bring to bear, again, those top-down cognitive processes to, to pay attention to certain things, ignore other things, to... Um, check back with memory. Have I experienced this before? Uh, what, what should be my next plan of action based on my memory of the situation and planning and all that kind of business. Um, so I think the idea that 
that you've got circuits, um, not just from the bottom up, but top down, and a lot of interaction between those brain circuits. They sometimes call it re-entrant circuits, where you've got processing mm. going on that feeds back on processing, and then that changes the processing that then goes farther up um, to higher parts of the brain. Sometimes it's been called kind of like an upward spiral kind of thing, where processing feeds back, mm. And then it ascends to the next level and it processes and it ascends to the next level until you get to, you know, people talk about what is the highest kind of part of the brain in terms of like, who's the boss, you know, kind of a homunculus mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, and that, that's a really difficult question. Everybody's argued. Uh, I know Christoph Ko Koch uh, used to argue um, that the thalamus was kind of where it's at. Like a certain part of the thalamus was kind of where consciousness takes place because you got mm -hmm. a lot of cortical, circuits down to the thalamus and the thalamus is the seat where all the sensory stuff comes in. So you're looking at where you're looking for that kind of locus or, or where all that top down bottom stuff kind of comes together. Um, mm -hmm. But when it comes to the brain, lots of different things are connected to lots of different things. So it's, it's kind of hard to point at one part of the brain and say, Hey, that's where consciousness is happening. It's a very difficult question. People debate about, where's the the place it happens. And I don't know if that's the right question because uh, it may take the whole brain dynamically working together with all its connections to create some complex phenomenon, you know, like consciousness. Right. I think yeah, that makes sense too, because even when you, when you divide a human brain into two different, you know, you, when you cut the corpus callosum, it, it results in two different consciousnesses. Right. Yeah. I, I think that's, I think that's a sound conclusion based on the evidence from split brain patients. Yeah. They've, they've now have two different, sometimes competing, you know, they have competing goals or they have, you know, d different experiences that, that used to yeah. be unified but are no longer unified. Um, one of the, one of the things I think that's the most exciting about um, neuroscience right now and the question of consciousness is, um, I don't know if you heard of the default mode network. You yeah. may have heard about that. Yeah. At some point. So there are these areas of the brain that seem to be, they're active when we're not doing anything in particular. And what I mean by that is they're more like introspection. They're more like daydreaming. Um, they kind of accidentally discovered these areas when people were waiting in MRI scanners uh, for the experiment to start. These scientists noticed a particular pattern that emerged when people weren't doing anything in particular, like responding to the outside world. And I think right. that mode network, if we're looking for something that, that is kind of, related to access consciousness, like our ability to use the sensory information for all these fancy things like planning and decision-making and, and those kinds of things. Uh, I think that system, it's a very highly interconnected system, mostly kind of higher brain levels like the prefrontal cortex and the cingulate cortex and some areas like that. Um, when we're engaging with the world, that system is offline. When we're not engaging with the world and kind of in our own head, that's the system that is kind of predominant. And so I think it's a very interesting system to, to keep very, you know, focusing on what do those individual brain systems do? And then when they're collectively active together, that's a very, you know, that's like the, the very, that's like the neural underpinning of introspection. It's like you're analyzing the content of your own mind. And I think that's a very interesting place to, to, to look for that access consciousness kind of stuff. And that's still that those discoveries are still relatively new enough that not a whole lot of looking into that has been done yet. Yeah, yeah, I, I, maybe like ten years ago or so, that literature um, people started talking about the default mode network and how mm -hmm. it from some of the other you know attentional networks. So when it comes to attention, we've got endogenous attention is when we make a decision to move our attention to something. Exogenous attention is when. Um, I'm sorry, exogenous is, is when it's stimulus driven, something catches our attention at the outside. Those mm -hmm. two systems are distinct from the default mode network, but the default mode network can interact with those systems to, to change, you know, where we're placing our attention either internally or externally. So I think that's a really interesting um, system. And the more they've studied it, you know, they, they've looked at the effect of psychedelic drugs, for instance, on the default mode network. Um, and mm -hmm. the whole network seems to shut down um, during like psychedelic, like LSD, psilocybin kinds right. of things. And it seems to be that, you know, we would think of those as very introspective processes, you know, these, you know, having these uh, 
flights of ideas and hallucinations and things like that. But it seems like when the default mode network is shut off, uh, those other systems just kind of run, run wild where you, and you get lots of interesting associations and ideas. And I think under normal circumstances, the default mode network is there to kind of coordinate all these other brain systems to some extent. Mm-hmm. When it goes offline, all hell breaks loose <laughs> for, for lack of a better, you know, term. Yeah. All those connections are free to connect. Yeah, yeah. Send stuff around the brain. Unique ideas and, you know, things that, you know, obviously they've, you know, we we talk about creativity and those kinds of things, just ideas that would not have otherwise occurred. And they can occur in dream state, meditation, you know, things like that as well. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. So with with that, um, so I don't even know, do you do MRIs on animals? And and are you you able to see the the default mode network with their brains or is that something – yeah, I, I, humans have that, or... um, I do know that over the past 10, maybe a little bit more years, we've been able to, to get MRIs uh, for smaller animals like rats. Uh, I've even seen some right. data, uh, MRI in songbirds, and that's a really, really small brain. <laughs> um, the resolution is not great, uh, but as the technology advances and our, you know, our algorithm, algorithms to analyze those signals get better... Um, I think that's going to be a lot of work in that field, you know, in the coming decade or so, because um, once we could focus the, those magnetic, you know, signals down to the, you know, that smaller brain, we have a tool that we really didn't have before. You know, we had cruder tools, you know, where you're dissecting the brain and, you know, we can look mm-hmm. at and gene expression and things like that. But being able to look at live animals re- reacting and behaving and things like that, there's a lot of technical challenges to it but I think that's going to be a big kind of future, you know, thing is looking at animals interacting, forming memories, doing these kinds of things and active, you know, live scanning of what's going on in their brain. It is very technical thing to do, but I think that's going to be a really interesting uh, kind of frontier, if you will. Yeah. Yeah. I bet so. And, And speaking of experiments like that, what kind of experiments are being done right now? you know, in, in comparative cognition and animals and how do you get inside to call that black box of an animal's mind and, and draw a conclusion of, about what's going on with their mental lives? Yeah. So, so that's a really tricky one. Um, the best designed experiments, you know, one of the things with animal research that's always been there is, is when you find a phenomenon and you can associate it with a higher function, whether it be consciousness or, you know, something like that, um, you always have to deal with the issue, you know, can you explain that behavior in simpler terms? You know, um, take the simplest possible explanation for that external behavior, unless you have more evidence that that's not sufficient. You know what I mean? So right. designing, the, designing the correct experiments to, to rule out those simpler explanations and really get to things like consciousness or, you know, other things. Um, most of those experiments that I'm familiar with look at very specific elements that might go into this, you know, thing that we call consciousness. So they look at um, concept formation, like how do animals learn about stimuli and then generalize to other stimuli? Um, You know, a lot of that's kind of classical conditioning, operant conditioning kind of stuff. Um, Mm -hmm. Language in other animals. uh, There's also a lot of work in social cognition. So how other animals see themselves and see other animals the simplest, you know, kind of, you can, I guess you call it self-consciousness is the mirror test, which you probably, right. um, which animals can pass the mirror test. You know, if, if you anesthetize them, put a spot on their forehead, they wake up, do they inspect the mirror as if it's another organism or do they inspect themselves? Like that's a kind of a rudimentary, you know, self-consciousness. And then expanding right. on that, how do they understand the intentions of other members of their group? You know, that's kind of a theory of mind kind of thing. Um, Do they practice deception, right? So that kind of, I'm always fascinated by the deception research in primates, for instance, because you have to have a theory of mind to know that, that you have an intention and other members of your group may have different intentions. Can you deceive them? Can you trick them? Can you take advantage of them? That's a pretty sophisticated, you know, cognitive ability. And there's a lot of work in that right now to see if what extent do animals deceive each other to take advantage of each other um, and be able to essentially put themselves in another animal's perspective, which is kind of what we were talking about earlier. 
Um, yeah, so, you're thinking something it is like to be that ape that I can steal his banana. Right, right. Yeah, so that theory of mind is a, is a very interesting area for me because I think, you know, if anything, if we talk about humans, we're a very social species and we're also a very symbolic species. So I think that social cognition part, seeing to what extent we can, you know, either in the field or in, in the laboratory, design experiments that, that get at how sophisticated are primates or other animals uh, in their social cognition. I think that's a really interesting area. Yeah. Yeah, that sure is. So when you, when you think about these experiments and look at experiments you've done before, you know, where are you professionally, personally on consciousness of animals? Like what, what are your current hypotheses on, on consciousness of animals? Where do you stand on this? Yeah. So that's one of those, you know, consciousness, people have debated about it forever or at least, you know, right. a long time. Um, sometimes my, my glib response is I don't think consciousness exists. And then of course people want, well, I've heard know? that before. I've had an entire podcast on that. I, I'm going to check that one out. <laughs> so yeah, you know, it's a uh, Keith Frankish illusion. Okay. I will definitely check that out. Um, I think one of the things about consciousness is, you know, our language language gets in the way sometimes. And I think the thing we call consciousness is actually probably a whole satellite or a whole set of tools. You know, I kind of think of like a Swiss army knife and mm -hmm. that on the, in that Swiss army knife, you know, we put a piece of tape on it with a Sharpie and label it consciousness, but it encompasses, you know, attention, planning, memory, language. Um, there's also something I'm very interested in called mental time travel which along with episodic memory, you know, episodic memory is the ability to replay experiences from the past. Whereas mental time travel, you know, as a, as a part of that, we can also project into the future. We can plan, we can form hypotheses. Well, if I do this action, what will happen? And we can kind of see several steps down the road, how we think that experience might unfold. That's a very complicated and sophisticated, you know, function. I think some animals can do mental time travel to some extent. And I see, I think different animals have different levels of attention, how much they can keep in short term memory. So one of the things that informs my, my kind of view of consciousness is that it's, it's a constellation of things that we've labeled consciousness as a bunch of other functions. Mm -hmm. And that also speaks to the fact that when we talk about consciousness, we always have to think about qualitative versus quantitative differences. And I don't think at all that consciousness is like a light switch. You either have it or you don't. I think very few natural phenomenon are like that. And if we assume it's a natural phenomenon, there are those who say otherwise. But if we go for a naturalistic account of consciousness, it's probably exists on a range, you know, in a range of possibilities uh, in different animals. And, and their consciousness is quite different than our consciousness. It's a matter of degree. And, and, and the degree of those individual elements, like attention, like memory, you know, those kinds of things uh, that represent, you know, their consciousness. So I don't, I don't think it's an either or phenomenon. I think very often in the past, people have assumed, well, it, you know, humans have it, nobody else has it. You know, Descartes talked about animals being essentially automatons, right? That they're, they're mm -hmm. they respond to stimuli, but there's nothing going on you know, up there. They're not conscious. They don't have spirits or souls or, you know, things like that. I totally disagree with that. If it's, if it's a natural phenomenon, it probably exists in a range across different animals. Um, and even within a particular species like birds, a pigeon's consciousness, an owl's consciousness, a crow's consciousness. I'm sure there's similarities because of the, their, their sensory capabilities, but I think it's going to be pretty different, but it's on a range. Right. Yeah, that is a wide range you can see just with the birds. Because obviously, like we have a lot of doves around her around here, and, and my mm -hmm. my daughter loves them because they're dumb, <laughs> yeah. right? And she she thinks well, they're really cute because they're so dumb. Right. Uh, they're not dumb. My work has been in pigeons, and pigeons and doves are the same family. Um, mm -hmm. They're very adaptable. You know, I like to give pigeons pigeons props because they've been able to survive in human built environments, just like rats, for instance. Uh, so I guess yeah, they've done very well. Behavioral flexibility, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I, I wouldn't put them up against a crow when it comes to tool use or <laughs> puzzle solving. Yeah. 
Yeah, I do. I do find that interesting that there, there's such a wide. I never, because I never even really thought about birds and the and the range of intelligence and cognition and maybe mm-hmm. even consciousness that you have there. So, I guess that's what you were mentioning about degrees of consciousness. Is yeah, you know, even within within one range. Of, I don't. I don't know what the correct term is for birds in general, but from birds, uh, mammals, reptiles, there must be different degrees of consciousness among all these different layers within them and also across the differences of different animals. Yeah. Yeah. So across the classes of vertebrate animals and also within the class, you know, the different species. So if someone says, well, you know, do, um, you know, do birds have episodic memory, right? Like, while which birds, you know, and what, which, which ones have we studied? Um, and what can we draw from those experiments? So, you know, crows and pigeons saying, saying, you know, one blanket statement about, birds is the same thing as saying it about mammals or even primates like yeah. can primates develop language well which primates under which conditions you know so i had a i had a question about the hard question of consciousness with animals but i think i think you pretty much covered that especially with the the, the potential allusion to illusionism did you did you have any other thoughts about the hard question of consciousness before i jump into the next question Yes, I mean, so so Chalmers, you know, the hard problem, um, I guess that kind of maps onto phenomenal consciousness. And mm-hmm. because of the, the, you know, the inherent subjectivity of that, um, you know, unless we can somehow model brain activity and then create, I don't know, you could create a virtual environment or something that plays out what that's like, um, that's just a, you know, well, like Chalmers said, it's a super hard problem to get at. It's the most elus- elusive, you know, aspect of consciousness. So if consciousness is, is that one thing, I don't know if we'll ever be able to, to kind of, to crack that problem. But, but from my perspective, if you look at consciousness as, as kind of a constellation of, you know, of things you can kind of get at, the more you learn about attention and memory and mental time travel and language and uh, symbolic, you know, representation of the brain, I think you're getting closer, but it it is definitely a difficult. Yeah, Yeah, it does seem to be because even at the latest uh, consciousness um, convention down in Tucson a few months ago, he, his presentation, Chalmers, Dr. Chalmers presentation was even on the meta of the hard question. So it's almost like, okay, we're never going to answer this question. Let's talk about the question. And it was, uh, it was pretty fascinating, but it's right. It's almost like we're never going to be able to answer this question. So let's, let's move on and, and think about the question itself. Right. Well, yeah, that, that's very interesting. I'd like to look that up because um, that, that, you know, now we're going to talk about the, talk about the question. <laughs> yeah. And, and it was interesting. I mean, that's how I discovered Keith Frankish and illusionism. And so he just went through and presented a bunch of perspectives on consciousness and shot a bunch of them down in his, in his view, you know, which is what um, chippy philosophers do. And so it was, uh, it was just interesting to, to see that and to, to see the reaction, but yeah, it's a uh, hard question has not gotten any easier, but I think with your constellation analogy, you know, and, and illusionism and, you know, I think that that's settling with me as, as being a pretty good way to look at it, especially when you're looking at the, the full spectrum of, of consciousness and cognition from these lower level brains and, and up to the human brain and, and how the differences in consciousness you see throughout it. I think your perspective provides a lot of really good insight into kind of walking around that hard question. Right. Yeah. I mean, it, it may, it may simplify things, you know, too much, but at least we have some experimentally, it's something we can sink our teeth into, you know? Um, yeah. Those different potentially aspects of consciousness, if we can better define them and study them in other animals, you know, as I would argue um, that there's a lot to be learned from um, how other animals potentially see the world and how they experience the world. The, the extent that we can, peek in that black box with very clever, you know, cleverly designed experiments and try to rule out more simplistic, you know, possibilities, then we can really get at, you know, what is the experience of other animals and are they conscious and what is that consciousness like? So, yeah. Yeah. So I, and I think, you know, given your, your thought that consciousness may not exist and the, the constellation theory, do you have any other thoughts on, 
kind of where you personally stand philosophically on consciousness? Anything else to add to that? Um, well, I, I know that um, something that I've been working on lately, so a lot of my prior work, um, you know, in brain evolution and um, has been connected to how the dopamine system functions and attention and cognitive flexibility and things like that. And, you know, that, you know, I would argue attention is a big part of the, you know, at least the access consciousness, if we're going to put it that way. Um, right. I've been thinking a lot more higher level questions about how human consciousness emerged. Uh, I also teach evolutionary psychology. So I'm very interested in questions mm-hmm. around, you know, to the extent does, does language is our unique kind of consciousness. Um, can it exist without language? You know, is there a way to have that without language? Because language is kind of the ultimate symbolic, you know, kind of form of representation. Um, right. So I'm actually thinking a lot about, I'm working with a colleague of mine uh, who's actually a, he got his degree in communication, but we're thinking about how technology and language enabled consciousness and that consciousness was not something that just kind of emerged all of a sudden, you know, from an evolutionary standpoint. Um, mm-hmm. it emerged slowly and inconsistently across individuals and that the development of language and tool use and those kinds of things, again, kind of created that feedback loop for our modern form of consciousness as we understand it to develop in all its richness and things like that. So I've been thinking a lot about how these internal processes interact with the environment and then the environment feeds back on brain evolution. So and not only with the individual, but with the whole group. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So this idea that consciousness all of a sudden emerged in every human being on earth at some time doesn't really fit a, you know, a biological evolutionary model. It probably showed up in a few people uh, in a certain, certain type, you know, in a certain degree. And then as we developed ways of communicating with each other, we influenced each other's brains and that enabled a, a fuller, richer kind of consciousness again, enabled by tool use and technology and language where we can record our thoughts, exchange our thoughts that actually fed, you know, fed back and created a lot of opportunity for further brain expansion. Yeah. No, that makes good sense. And another one of my guests, I can't remember, I can't be sure of who it was, so I won't say a name and get it wrong. Mm -hmm. But another one of my guests mentioned the exact same thing that how closely tied language is to the emergence and evolution of human consciousness. Yeah, I think it's, you know, when you get into linguistics and language theory, it gets pretty deep, pretty fast. Mm. Um, So I've only kind of skirted, you know, I mean, I've I've read some about, you know, could we have the kind of consciousness we have without language? Can you represent super, you know, kind of super layered and complex ideas without language? You know, can you do it without language? I'm not sure. My, my, my inclination right now is that language is absolutely essential for the kind of consciousness that we're talking about. And of course, as, as for our prior conversation, you don't need language to have a kind of consciousness. Again, it's a matter of degree, but I think yeah. language enables that symbolic representation to kind of just explode. And then, you know, the, the com- combinations of new ideas and concepts that language enables is it's pretty limited if you don't have language to, yeah, as a substrate. So are there animals that have language? That is also a big debate. Um, so usually when we talk about language, uh, you can break it up into communication, right? Proto language mm-hmm. and language. Uh, the fact that animals communicate, everybody knows this, that this mm-hmm. is a dispute. Um, language has a certain quality of uh, being, you know, it's abstract. The, the symbols and letters we use don't actually relate to the objects themselves, depending on the language, of course. Right. Uh, and our ability to, to create brand new utterances from these basic elements, whether they be alphabet or symbols or, or what have you, um, nobody's convincingly sh- yet show that animals have true, or you, you could call quote unquote true language. They can be trained to have proto language, which means they can develop a vocabulary. They can put a limited number of words or, or syllables or symbols together in unique ways. That's usually referred to as proto language. Uh, but the full generativity and all that kind of stuff of language, um, it certainly doesn't appear to occur in the wild. And you can develop, you know, you, you can develop proto-language in a, a gorilla like Coco or 
uh, some chimpanzees uh, like uh, Washoe and, and some of these other examples. But um, most people, well, I shouldn't say most, but there's still a big debate about whether they can show true language ability or if it's just really more of a, you have to intensively train them just to get them to kind of a proto language, maybe up to a three year, three year old level vocabulary, you know, kind of thing. So yeah. it's a really t- tough one. Um, because these, these one, the, the experiments we know about have, you know, studied these, these individual animals for decades to train them to get to this kind of rudimentary language use. And that, that seems to argue that they don't do something similar in the wild. They have a relatively limited repertoire of communication, um, you know, vocalizations or body postures or facial expressions. And that's kind of all they need and they don't really go beyond it. Yeah, and that makes sense. And I think even as I was thinking of the question, what, what I was really thinking of without knowing it was communication. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. there's a question they communicate. Like if you look at vervet monkeys, they have different uh, vocalizations for different kinds of predators. And they learn that, you know, the infants learn it from the parents by association. So they'll make a sound, you know, watch out for an eagle in the sky and then they'll run for the bushes or watch out for a snake you know, and they run up into trees. So they have different, you could say they're words if you want to do that, but they have different calls for different things, right? Different signifiers. And that's a kind part of a proto-language, um, but it doesn't have the generativity and flexibility. And, you know, vervet monkeys aren't talking about, hey, remember yesterday when we saw that snake? Wasn't that terrible? We don't think that yeah. they, you know, but that's as far as we can tell. Yeah, and I can see how that is tied to emergence of of consciousness and the feedback loop that's that, that's a pretty interesting concept of language and could it could it exist without language right right and then also yeah, that's something to think about episodic memory we know that animals can react based on their past experiences right that's a kind of a classical conditioning operant conditioning kind of thing but you know we don't know if if there's there's some evidence from birds and some evidence from other animals you know does your dog think about when you took him to the dog park last week, does he think about that? Does he say, Oh, that was a really fun time. Uh, Do they experience their past? Like we do. We don't really know that for sure. There's some pretty clever experiments with certain kinds of um, birds that store nuts and they will hide them certain places. And there's some clever experimental manipulation where you can, you can kind of show that they seem to be thinking in in a episodic you know, reflective way. It's not just a reflexive stimulus driven kind of thing, but that that's again, mm-hmm. you know, part of that richness of consciousness, especially as part of our identity is our memory, right? The stories we have about our life is the core of identity. You know what I mean? Right. So that's also something I've been interested in is, you know, the episodic memory versus mental time travel that gives a richness and, and kind of value to consciousness that I think is kind of underexplored right now. Yeah, and it almost implies that almost the beginning of, almost of an ego. Yeah, yeah. The, the question of ego is so interesting because, you know, we, we kind of put that away with Freud and all that kind of stuff, but it's really coming back a lot, actually, because it's such a useful concept. Kind so of given same. all these things, you got a lot Your – I'm sorry, did you have more on that? Oh, no, I was just going to mention, you know, that idea of self-consciousness, do, do other animals – conceive of themselves as, as a, as an individual being, you know, uh, you know, in their society, are they, do they have certain, they have goals, you know, they have things they want. Do they think about it a lot? Like, do they think about protecting their identity or ego? I mean, that's a really kind of way out there <laughs> kind of question. Yeah. Uh, it's a super interesting one. You can see all these things kind of working, working together from, language and, and cognition and higher levels of brain and, and sensory input and, you know, communication and, and all this stuff working together. And all of a sudden this, this sense of self pops up. Right. And it's almost like that, that sense of self is where, uh, you know, a consciousness can really emerge because there is the thought of what is it like to be something and experience something and the phenomenal mm-hmm. experience, the quality of, you know, it all kind of seems like it would just emerge from that, all those things coming together. I guess that's your constellation. Right. I guess you just helped me understand it. 
Yeah, yeah. And that kind of reminds me of, you know, the, the psychedelic um, studies that, that are going on, um, well, since the 60s or so, but really th there's been a resurgence in the 90s and early 2000s with psychedelic research, whether it be mm -hmm. or end of life issues, you know, palliative care and that kind of thing. But, but they talk, you know, a lot of these experiences, people that have these experiences talk about the dissolution of their ego. Like they become mm -hmm. fever, but they're not there. Like their ego, their identity is, is absent and yet they're still consciously experiencing things. So that's a really interesting way of thinking about it too, especially. Yeah, in the it is. Alex tend to turn off the default mode network that I mentioned. So what is mm -hmm. that? About? Is the default mode network? Is that our ego? Is, is that the management aspect of our brain? <laughs> you know, and when it goes away, we still have experiences, but we don't have that ego sense anymore. So I think that's a fascinating. Yeah. Thing. Yeah, it really is. And, and for anybody listening up to this point, you can go check out a, one of the other podcasts here with uh, Raphael Millier, where he discussed uh, drug induced ego dissolution specifically with uh, psychedelics. So that is, yeah. And I think he jumped into the default mode network, but that sure is interesting if you could find if there was a correlation to that quieting down with the dissolution of the ego. Um, but like you said, consciousness is still there without that. Right. Yeah. And, and the, and these folks that take these experiences, they, they are utterly convinced of the reality of it. Like, like many of them, like if you look at the end of life, um, care, you know, psychedelic therapy with, with those folks, uh, even if they enter the experience as atheists, they say, I think something exists beyond death. Like I didn't think so before, but after this experience and having my ego like go away, but there's still something sensing and experiencing without that ego they come back convinced mm -hmm. some kind of existence after you know after death which right. is pretty startling so they take somebody who's a materialist and all of a sudden you know they believe that something will survive beyond the physical death of the brain that's pretty transformative so well we're getting getting here close to the end i did have a couple questions i want to ask about your future um, sure. you know what, what are you going to be working on what other studies do you have coming up or experiments and also you know, with your studies and experiments, do you foresee any uh, significant outcomes or discoveries coming in, in terms of animal consciousness? Well, so uh, as far as my work coming up, you know, I, I did mention um, looking at the evolution of human consciousness as kind of like a very slow spreading thing that was uh, mm -hmm. fed back by our technology um, and our ability to manipulate symbols and, and record them. You know, written language was incredibly important because then we could kind of solidify these ideas without them just kind of going away or relying on storytelling right. like that. So that's something I'm working on um, over the next year or so is it's either going to be a series of manuscripts and or a book depends on how ambitious I get um, and how much time I have. But uh, that's something I've been working on and um, also been working on uh, particular parts of the uh, avian brain that subserve social behavior. So some of my work has been in, um, mm -hmm. Um, both social cognition and sexual behavior and looking at the genes and proteins and brain areas involved with that. Um, there is a kind of a hypothesis called the social behavior network, which is there's an interconnected series of brain areas that, that subserve being a social animal. And there's a lot of complexity in being a social animal. So um, I'm really looking at how those areas have evolved in the, in the avian brain and whether they have, um, you know, substrates in mammals and by extension, you know, primates and humans. So that's some of the stuff I'm working on right now. Well, all, I hope it turns into a book. Yeah, well, we'll see. <laughs> um, and yeah. as where consciousness is going, uh, as far as where is it going in terms of research, I think kind of slow, steady progress, you know, plugging away at these, um, like, a, you know, like, like you phrased, this constellation of things that I talk about. Um, mm -hmm furthering those experiments, you know, refining them, having very good hypotheses and well-controlled experiments to look at um, different organisms, you know, um, their brain structure and how that might serve consciousness or things that, you know, are a part of that conscious concept. I think it's going to be kind of slow going, I think, uh, which I kind of mentioned before is if there's really fast growth in the area, I think that the use of MRI and imaging techniques in smaller animals, yeah. is a huge deal. Uh, because so far, you know, the methods we've had have been pretty crude. Um, 
you know, you, you lesion a brain structure and then see if they can't do something anymore. That's a pretty crude <laughs> way of going about looking at brain function. But um, right. it's going to be slow and steady progress. I think people are getting interested in more animals. So rather than just lab rats, mice, and maybe pigeons and crows, people are starting to, to branch out and look at uh, octopi, you know, very smart invertebrate, whose brain is way different than a, than a vertebrate brain. Um, and I think we can get some insights into looking at so many different brains and seeing how they do things. I think that'll give us a lot of insight uh, into ourselves. How far away do you think we are from having the technology to do that? Um, probably, uh, I would only say a couple of years. I mean, they're already doing some, um, some MRI stuff in rats and mice. And like I mentioned, mm -hmm. software. the resolution is pretty poor, uh, but it's getting better. So it's really a matter of the technology. As often, a lot of these scientific discoveries, they're waiting to be had. We just don't have the tool yet, right, to tap into. Right. So um, I'm looking for a lot of, you know, a lot of things to change for the technology, and that's going to enable a whole series of, you know, kinds of experiments and lines of inquiry that we couldn't even kind of touch before. Right. That's, I, that's what I got my fingers crossed for. So. Yeah. Well, me too. Me too. That sounds exciting. I can't wait for that point to come. So is there anything that I haven't asked? Anything else that you'd like to, to get out there? Um, no, no. I think it's been, it's been a very wide ranging discussion and uh, it's been a, it's been a great one. Yeah. Well, thank you. And I, I appreciate that. It's been a real pleasure having you answer all these questions and you certainly have left me with a lot to think about. Well, good. Yeah. And, and in the conversation, it got me thinking about other things too. So that, that's the beauty of it. Um, I'm going to have to go back. Yeah. And just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Yeah, well, so that's that's it then, Scott. Um, I really okay. do appreciate your time. I mean, this, the discussion was fascinating, and I always know it's a good one when I get to the end, and I just like you said, I feel like I have things to go look up and to do some research on because it's uh, you opened up some other things for me to think about. Right. Well, yeah, there's no shortage when it comes to thinking about consciousness. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I guess I guess you're right. You know, approaches and ideas and. You know, I've always, you know, I, I use the access and phenomenal consciousness model because it's very useful. A lot of hardcore mm -hmm. philosophers have, have criticized it relentlessly, but it's such a heuristically useful thing, um, especially when it comes to, you know, thinking about these issues. I think that's why it's stuck around so long. Yeah, that makes sense. So some of them have a real problem with it, huh? Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, again, I, I really appreciate your time. Stuart, it was great to kind of virtually meet you. That concludes another edition of the Consciousness Podcast. Thanks again for listening. Please find us at Facebook at facebook.com slash the Consciousness Podcast at our Twitter handle at ConchCast. And don't forget to subscribe to our feed at theconsciousnesspodcast.com. Thank you for listening.